All right. We will get this started. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> this is the future of wireless pen testing with uh, Dragorn, who, uh, if you've been to previous cons, seems to be at every one of them as well. Uh, he is number 39. Thorn, the gentleman in the middle, will be known as 45 from this moment forward. And Renderman, uh, who is known as number 112 or Guy in the Fedora. <laughs> um, you guys ready? Well, Take it away. All righty. Hi, everybody. Glad you can make it today. Um, do you want to make your customary comment? No. No, okay. <laughs> There's just a lot of you out there, and Mike had noticed that before. Um, we're we're going to talk today about the future wireless uh, penetration testing, but obviously to talk about the future of it, we've got to kind of take a, a picture of what we did in the past and uh, what we're currently at. So I'm going to talk first about the history just a little bit, and then we're going to bounce around different topics for today. Um, back in the oh, late 1990s, right around 2000, a lot of technology started to come together with uh, the wireless stuff. The big push came when in about 2001, uh, 802.11 got extremely affordable by everybody, at the consumer level at least. Uh, and at that point, wireless pen testing really started to take off. Uh, the first kind of programs that came out about it were uh, from Pete Chipley had done an early uh, script in San Francisco back in 2001. Uh, NetStumbler was written also in 2001, and in late 2001, uh, Dragorn wrote uh, the uh, first version of Kismet. Thank you for the many hours of entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> So at that point, uh, people started to become aware of this stuff being available and that it was kind of open and out there. And the whole thing really started to take off. Uh, I did my first war drive in about September 2001. And in five miles, I came up with about five networks. Uh, in comparison to that today, uh, I think there's something on the order of about 300 networks in that same five miles. Right, Little hand. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that that kind of brings us up to today that we we've got this big jump. It's out there. Everybody's starting to get involved in it, and we're kind of kind of talk about the rest of the the panel of, or the session today is we're going to talk about what are we going to do in the future. Of it. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dragon. Uh, uh, figured we'd uh, touch a little bit briefly on what Kismet will be doing in the future. Um, the major rewrite has been in works for a little over two years since just before the last hope. Uh, I wish I could say it was done for release today, but I can't. But you can get it from Subversion in the state it's in currently. Uh, the main things uh, useful for pen testing that will be in that release is Kismet finally supports plugins. So every time I say, I'm not going to put that in there, someone else can with a plug-in now. <laughs> uh, you can do injection through it. Uh, there'll be smarter uh, drones so that you can treat remote captures like a Linksys connected to a Windows machine as a local card. And uh, plugins can do anything that Kismet can do now. So you can add new GPS systems. Uh, there might even be a plug-in to handle Bluetooth built into the system. Uh, and we'll take some more questions on that after but I'll turn it over to RenderMan for some 802.11 stuff. OK. Um, basically, with the, the future of wireless, there's a, a couple of different areas we're seeing as big. Uh, 802.11's here to stay. We're not getting rid of it. Um, Bluetooth is coming up big. Uh, that's going to be another huge thing in the future. And RFID, it's wireless. We're all going to have to deal with it at some point or another. Um, starting with the, the 802.11 stuff, uh, 802.11i, uh, the new wireless spec, uh, security spec coming out, usually everybody calls it WPA2, even though that's not the actual ratified version. Um, I don't know what the IEEE working groups are thinking on these things, but I don't know. I, I just see some severe problems with 802.11i coming out. Reason being is if you actually look through the spec, there's this wonderful little statement in there saying, um, 
there's a, a function called the, the Michael countermeasure, uh, message integrity check. Basically, if an access point running 802.11i receives two messages that have bad checksums on the packets, it will shut down the radio and recompute all the keys and, and renegotiate everything. It does this, it shuts down the radio for 60 seconds. When it does this, it sends out a deauthentication packet to all the clients saying, I'm going down because something went wrong and you know, I'm recalculating things. Within this spec, there's this wonderful line that says, because we can't verify the authenticity of this deauthentication packet from the access point as being actually from the access point, we know it can be spoofed, we're just gonna ignore it and continue trying to connect to that same SSID and MAC address. So, I send two packets to the radio with bad uh, message integrity checks. The radio turns off and now I can slide in my own access point with the same SSID and MAC address. <laughs> this, th this is gonna be interesting. Um, I don't know what the 802.11 groups or in the IEEE are, are thinking with these things. Um, they just don't seem to really be catching on that there are problems and they, they have the ability to address them when they're designing the specs. They just don't seem to be doing anything sane. On a similar note, the 802.11 W spec is going to address finally some of the access point authentication measures to keep it from being so easy to knock everyone off a network, except they don't address most of the management frames that you can use to knock people off the network. So. And even that, they're saying, is like two years away from being ratified, so we're kind of stuck in the meantime here. <laughs> And, and to add to that whole thing too is that a lot of stuff is getting unplugged and getting thrown out into the same spectrum. Um, for instance, uh, just something I learned last night is I'm sure you're all aware of a lot of burglar alarms that are, are going wireless. Um, a lot of those things are basically, uh, I mean fire alarms, they're basically just kind of out there going, I'm not in an alarm state and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, and then oops, I'm in an alarm state. Um, and that's not a big deal until you realize that some of their devices are directly um, actionable on the outside of the building. For instance, there are things that are uh, known as Knox boxes that carry the keys to buildings. These des designs so the fire department can gain access to the building in case of an emergency. They usually see this on apartment buildings, a little FD logo on the things. Yeah, they're usually okay. a little triangle, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, but those things, if they get triggered off, will actually start to open on some alarm systems now, allowing anybody, hopefully the fire department, but if anybody has spoofed the alarm system, uh, you can gain access to the building physically by the building has just handed you the key. Uh, some of the bigger ones will actually give you blueprints, so you can have blueprints and a key. Um, so there's a lot of things like that that are getting unplugged. So as, as things are changing and evolving with pen testing in general, um, we're just, we're going strictly from kind of beyond the whole idea of the information into physical access to the buildings at the same time. Um, people are just taking a lot of things and saying, well, it's real easy to unplug it, and they're not thinking about the, what the ramifications are. Uh, as it, they go along. For instance, a security camera. So now you can check to make sure no one's in that part of the building before you unlock it. Yeah, cameras are a real good example because those things are completely unplugged, they're completely unsecure, and because they're based on the regular television signals, they're specifically not encrypted. So anybody, if you know what the frequency is for a, a given uh, uh, camera can just tune into the camera and see what's going on up there. How many of you remember that the opening scene from uh, the movie Sneakers? Yeah, okay. For for those of you who don't, um, basically they set off a smoke bomb inside of a bank in a safe deposit box. Smoke goes up, sets off the fire alarm, and automatically all the emergency fire doors open up, which allows the guys to run in the back. You know, security guards there, alarms going off. He doesn't know what to do gets a phone call saying, oh yeah, we've been having all sorts of problems with the alarm, it'll, it'll shut off in a minute. You know, and then, 
oh, it does. Yeah. But now everybody's in. So you can imagine a situation where with this alarm system, you trigger it, oh, no fire. Trigger it, oh, no fire. You do this enough times, people are going to think, oh, something's busted, something's shorted, whatever. You trip it the next time, you just walk up and take the keys because you know the fire department's probably not going to be called because, oh, it's just an error. Oh, what else? <laughs> Client attacks. How many of you run firewalls normally on your laptops when you're connected onto wireless? Okay, there should be a hell of a lot more hands than that. <laughs> um, For the people who couldn't see, that was probably about 10 to 15 percent raised their hands. I don't, new tools coming out. Um, I know that uh, there's going to be some interesting stuff coming out of DEF CON uh, about 802.11 fuzzing and attacks to uh, drivers for wireless cards. It, for a long time, everybody's been focusing on attacking the access point, gaining access to the network that way. Well, there's been more and more research coming out about attacking the clients themselves and either getting them to come over to another access point or just you know, doing nasty things to their data. Um, what are some of those? Oh, there's the, the evil twin. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the Basically. evil twin concept. Uh, just, I think that there's going to be a, a lot more focus on getting access to those clients because, I mean, we've all seen the businessman that's in the airport doing his, his spreadsheets or whatever, and you, know, you never know who's on that flight next to you. Um, sometimes it's me. And uh, For anyone who's ever fired up a sniffer and noticed how many networks the Windows machines are probing for near you. How easy is it to create one of those networks? How likely is it that they have a firewall turned on? And not according very. to this room, not very wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it's really easy to just spoof something like Linksys, and all of a sudden you're an access point that you think you're connecting to, and it's actually him. Yeah. And I mean, how many people, you know, I'm not saying anybody here does it because it would be a felony. But how many people do we know that take advantage of the Linksys global network? <laughs> how do you know that is actually a Linksys access point and not just somebody doing man in the middle or, or whatever? Because <laughs> you could never spoof that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, no, to that it. Sorry. So, quick question, just quick hands up. How many of you on your access points at work or home have the SSID broadcast turned off? Why? Nobody can see you. <laughs> oh, nobody can see you. <laughs> There's just so much bad information out there. And I mean, we we're guilty of it to a certain degree because for the longest time we were saying turn off SSID broadcast. But there's so many IT people out there that will read, you know, a book that'll say, you do all of these things and you're going to be fine. Well, half the time, if you turn off the SSID broadcast, you're going to have more problems connecting than if you don't. So, it, it, it's just going to be more and more problems with uh, people just not understanding the instructions. Yeah, RTFM goes a long way, believe me. Towards the end of uh, replicating networks, the Karma tool is a modification of the Mad Wi Fi drivers for. for Atheros, which will automatically create a network for every probe request it sees. You don't even have to clone the network anymore. It will just bring up the access, it'll automatically respond to any probe request and attach them to your network. Uh, Another thing in the realm of client vulnerabilities is firmware vulnerabilities. I haven't seen any yet, but an Atheros card is basically an ARM7 chip running a fairly complex piece of software in the firmware. If you ever find a bug in that firmware, how often do you update that? I, I haven't seen many firmware updates come out. If there's a bug in that, you've got executab executability on a device attached to your PCI bus. That means you've got a device that you control attached to someone's memory system. Forget the operating system controls. You can scan their memory right out from underneath it if anyone ever exploits the firmware. Who knows? Hmm? Oh. Um, 
Yeah, well, it's just in, in regards to some of the stuff we've talked to before, or talked about a few minutes ago, uh, a lot of this stuff is all taking part in the same spectrum, too. You've got cameras like the X10s. Um, I mean, those things are all over the place. Uh, you've got obviously 802.11b uh, and G in the same space. Um, and some of these things are coordinated together, and some of them, such as me and G, some of them are not. Um, you put in a camera and a, an access point in close proximity, you get problems. Uh, basically, the whole spectrum in a lot of places is really getting overcrowded. Um, it, it's not uncommon in some places uh, to, to actually have someone kind of be a, an ad hoc uh, a coordinator for the spectrum in their building just because it's getting so crowded or in the neighborhood because it's getting so crowded. Uh, and th it's only going to get worse, people. Um, so one of the things to do with the pen testing is you're going to be taking kind of a look at the whole gamut in a given spectrum area uh, as to what kind of things are in there, what's vulnerable, what isn't. It's not just going to be B. It's not going to just be G. It's going to be things like cameras. It's going to be things like burglar alarms, which are also in the, in the 2.4 megahertz spectrum or gigahertz. gigahertz spectrum. It also means that you'll have to consider things that are no longer within that spectrum. Uh, Ubiquity Networks now has a 900 megahertz uh, Atheros-based 802.11 card. It's not truly 802.11. Uh, most IDS systems that are detecting if someone's plugged an unauthorized access point into their network, they're not looking at 900. Uh, Bluetooth access points, they exist. Uh, I believe Kensington makes one or Belkin makes one. Most IDS systems aren't looking for a Bluetooth access point, but it still means it's there and that you can connect to it and uh, possibly gain access to the network via that. Speaking about Bluetooth, just show of hands, how many people uh, have Bluetooth telephones on them today? Okay. How, I, I, and I've got one, uh, but I keep it. I keep the Bluetooth off on, on a lot of the functions. Um, just of that, how many of you are running in discoverable mode? That would be 37. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, uh, one person in the back raised their hand that I could see. Yeah. How, how many know that you have it in discoverable mode? That may be okay. It's one. So. This is not the device you're looking for. BlackBerry 8700. Choned. Is there a Brian Ventura in the audience? <laughs> well, there is. <laughs> I mean, this is just a quick sample of a group of people who should know exactly what their devices are doing. Now, how many people, how many like executives in that are going to fully understand the problems with leaving their Bluetooth phone? enabled. Like this is something that I think is going to really turn around and bite as more and more data ends up on these devices. You know, if they're walking around and they, they keep discoverability on because, oh, it's, it makes their headset easier to use, you know, they're, they could be exposing all sorts of fun things. You know? And I mean, and not even connected to the corporate network, but all sorts of, uh, like, uh, on hand, uh, Windows handheld devices, you got Outlooks, you got all their emails and all this other stuff. Just. It, the, the problem is no longer just contained within the building that you're having to control. You're having to worry about all these guys running around around the world signing contracts, and, and you got to chase after them and hold them down when they're in the office and beat it into them that there's a problem here. You might want to take care of this. Yeah, and it, and a lot of these things too. This you know just the physical security of the devices. Uh, you know, let's face it. How many people have put things like passwords on PDAs? Um, you know, you lose the PDA, you've just w given to whoever finds it your, your list of all your passwords. Um, and if a PDA talks via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to other devices around it, uh, are you creating bridging that you never even suspected? Maybe not, but there's a possibility. And again, if you're going to be doing any kind of penetration testing, you've got to be aware of these things and at least be thinking along the lines of, can we go from device A to device B to device C and into the inf infrastructure? Um, or can you go into device A and leave something that when they connect to the infrastructure gets you in? This would be what we would consider a device B. 
this teddy bear has an access point built into him. How many people would be rogue hunting for a teddy bear? Probably not a lot. One thing with the 802.11 stuff you're going to see is access points are getting smaller and smaller. You're not dealing with a big Linksys box anymore. You know, Thorn here says there's a, a D-Link one that's like the size of a USB stick. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit bigger. It's about an inch and a half square. Um, but it's, it's a great little device. I carry one around for, for going to different places. And it's, it's literally about this big. You won't notice it as an access point unless you know what you're looking for. You know, a big pair of rabbit ears sitting on top of a filing cabinet, kind of easy to spot. But something like this plugged in the back of a PC, you know, you're going to have to start searching really high and low for that stuff. Or a battery pack and a fl del uh, delivery of flowers to the secretary. Dude, don't give away all my secrets. <laughs> How many people have Bluetooth headsets? How many people have the pin, the uh, Bluetooth pin of four zeros or five zeros? How many of you wear them all the time? <laughs> How many of you have seen people on buses, subways, standing on a street corner, um, looking absolutely schizophrenic, you know, talking to themselves? You could probably go up front of the hotel in here and see that. Default pins on all these things. And it's always four zeros. No matter what model, it always seems to be four zeros. Or, or one, two, three, four. Oh, that's, that. yeah. Anytime you have a default like that, you can't change on a lot of devices. Like I got a Motorola M500 headset, and it's hard coded in there. What's that? Phone freaking over Bluetooth. Phone freaking over Bluetooth. But what, what I, where I see a problem, and one thing I actually want to see happen, all of these people who are on subways or, or movie theaters and that with their headsets on all the time, somebody needs to find a way to broadcast into all those things. <laughs> we need to introduce like an omniscient voice into the back of them, you know, into their heads and say, you know, I know what you did. I have the pictures. <laughs> somebody needs to do this. <laughs> Yeah, they can do it with some cars with a program called Car Whisperer, but I think you need to do this on a more personal level. I mean, it's nice to be able to reach out and say, you know, hey, jackass, you just cut me off. And like, what? what? Where's that coming from? <laughs> you know, backseat driver from a distance. But, you know, I, I think you need to get more personal and, and start, you know, scaring the living daylights out of these people. Or to invert that, open up the microphone. <laughs> and then broadcast it to other people in the, on other headsets. Oh. Sorry, we're just kind of making this up as we go. <laughs> we got a few <laughs> notes, but... No. Um, RFID is something that, I mean, there was a couple of really good talks this morning on it. Um, something that is all around us, whether or not you want it to be uh, Exxon Mobil Speed Pass, proximity cards, credit cards, it, it's everywhere. Why are a lot of these, why is RFID being used in a lot of these cases? There are so many examples, um, one of which, the passports. You know, August of this year, the US is gonna start putting RFID chips in their passports to be read you know, when you go across the border. Why do they need to be read at a distance? Like, is there bulletproof glass or something that prevents them from, you know, going from this far away to this far away? Like, there, there are so many contact-based systems. It's a solution looking for a problem. And you introduce so many problems into this, and most people don't seem to understand that when you, you know, introduce RFID, you're introducing levels of complexity that can fail on you. If your inventory control system is based on RFID, well, what's the life cycle of these things? Well, the manufacturer says that they're you know, good for 100,000 reads. Well, drive a Mack truck over it and then see if you can read it. You know, th these sort of things happen. You know, if you're depending on this, it's going to fail you. Yeah, and you know, going back to the idea of the pen testing with this is that if you're going to be doing a lot of, of, of pen testing and there's an RFID 
element into the building, for instance, access cards. It's just one more area where you're actually going to be unwired, but you're going to be kind of penetration testing on, on the whole system. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Jonathan West Hughes had a, was talking this morning about the, uh, the lady with the implanted Verichip in her arm. His little, uh, he has a project. Um, it's just a little credit card size circuit board, two switches. One side, one button reads, the other broadcasts. So all you have to do is just walk up to somebody, hit one button, swipes their, uh, it activates and swipes their, uh, the access codes for their uh, RFID proximity card, hit the other button and it just rebroadcasts it and lets you in. Now, this is something that can easily be done on a crowded elevator, subway, escalator, or just walking past. You know, the keys to the kingdom you know, are being broadcast on a small radio out of your executive's pockets. This is I believe U.S. passports last for 10 years. Is that valid? Correct, yeah. Right. So it's encrypted. How much crypto was developed 10 years ago, which has been broken since? Most of it. Does any, think, anybody you know, remember WEP? <laughs> <laughs> no. Or even MD5? <laughs> oh, so uh, what's the likelihood of this technology surviving in your passport for 10 years in a way that's going to be secure? We don't Not know. High. <laughs> and the thing is, they aren't releasing any of these you know, these uh, passports to the public for testing. Um, and the chips are made in Malaysia, he says. But you know, I would love to get my hands on these things. You know, they they integrated a, a tin foil hat in the front and the back. You know, so you can't read it when the, the book is closed. Well, you dump enough RF energy in there, and you're probably going to get something of it. You know, this is something that needs to be tested, but. For some strange reason, the State Department doesn't like sending sample passports to foreign nationals. I don't know why. <laughs> Q &A? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're going to open it up to uh, questions and answers. And they, uh, they asked us to remind people, if you do want to talk to us, uh, ask a question, please come up and use the microphones. And any ideas you have in the future, too. So. I got two questions for you. The first one was about uh, flash BIOS updates. Have you guys heard anything solid on uh, whether they've actually started exploiting that weakness or possible weaknesses? And the second thing I wanted to ask you is, what did you use on your laptop to scan for those Bluetooth devices? Uh, I haven't heard of anything. Well, there was the uh, Chernobyl, I had to remember, virus it's a while CIH. ago. Or CIH, which would nuke your BIOS. I don't see any reason it would be difficult to match the correct BIOS to flash into your system, but I see no reason that you couldn't flash a malicious BIOS into a system. Yeah, it's a level of development that most people aren't doing right now, but if there were a reason with enough money behind it, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be possible. The same would go for flashable access points or even downloadable firmware with uh, like a spoofed driver update that did download new firmware from the client machine into like an Atheros card or pretty much anything else that uses hot pluggable firmware now. There's no reason that they couldn't download some malicious firmware that did something either terrible overtly or covertly monitor your data. Okay, that's the last time I sent you my DEF CON presentation. <laughs> Sorry, um, uh, actually I don't think I saw your DEF CON. <laughs> oh. <laughs> One of the things I'm gonna be talking about there, I'm still working on it, hopefully. Um, basically with a lot of uh, consumer off-the-shelf access points, they're running Linux with a, a flashable firmware. But there's no way to verify that the firmware that's actually running on there is the one that's supposed to be there. Yeah, you can log in and see this nice Linksys web interface and everything like that, but do you actually know what's running under the hood? How do you write, how do you do an antivirus scan on your router? This is something that I think is gonna turn around and bite in the near future. Yeah. Oh, and in relation to this, uh, the Bluetooth scanning, Linksys, you know, USB adapter, class one, nothing particularly fancy, and uh, Network Chemistry's Blue Scanner. I mean, this is not anything terribly scary. This was just a, a quick test we decided to do just bef before the talk here. So, also for Linux, there's a uh, T Bear, and a few other similar scanners that um, just list all of the cards that are open for Bluetooth. Uh, connectivity. 
Just a, a curiosity question. How many of you, when you're looking for rogue access points in your uh, businesses or, or consulting, how many of you are also scanning for Bluetooth? Just a curiosity. Okay, not many. Okay. About a half dozen. Hmm. I think the uh, person in front was next. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have a question. I had more of a, like a comment or a statement. I Go think they it. build stuff like RFID and all this crap because it creates new markets and they try to get people interested in it. And then when it breaks, and then when it breaks, they introduce another market to fix it. And like, that's exactly what software. And I, you know, I, I, I do security for a living, like probably a lot of people. And don't you see all the products out there and all the money and all this crap you keep buying and you buy more crap that's broken so you can get more crap to fix the crap that's broken. You get a consultant to fix the crap that broke because you don't know how it's broken. And it, it, all it is is just a bunch of shit. Excuse my language, but that's what it is. And it just is perpetuating. And it's per, it's, it's, it's all on purpose. It's all on purpose to create markets. Well said. I mean, how many of you have seen installations of wireless where they'll spend ungodly amounts of money fighting you know, for Spectrum and they can't figure out how to keep this thing running and everything? It's like, okay, 100 bucks and I'll drop a wire over here. You're not moving from this location. Why do you need wireless? You know, just, uh, person in the middle? Um, I uh, personally uh, uh, encountered that Mick check something where it turns the radio off for 60 seconds. So I the decided mic, that... The Michael countermeasures? Yeah. The yeah. Mic. Um, that you were talking about earlier. Um, so I determined that WPA is broken and we all know WEP is broken. So is it possible to run uh, a Wi-Fi network that has any encryption on it? WPA done right can be moderately acceptable. Um, what I prefer for my own networks, like not in a business and whatnot, would be to sometimes even just turn off web entirely, leave the network open, and then use uh, layer three encryption, like a VPN tunnel. Uh, open VPN is dead simple to set up. I believe it runs on OS X, Windows, Linux, um, and there you go. You just firewall off your access point subnet. Uh, from the rest of your network, uh, only allow the VPN ports to the VPN server, and then tunnel everything over from there. Just another kind of question out to you people in general is show of hands. How many people are actually running any kind of firewall that's separating the wired portion from the wireless portion? That's not too bad. It's more than I expected. Yeah. So how long is it going to be before I can throw out my cow patty, my... Uh, Aircrack and all the rest of those, and they're finally integrated into Kismet. How much interest are you seeing in people to do that? Write a plugin. <laughs> uh, yeah, the easy answer is write a plugin. The harder answer, uh, CowPatty would actually be something that would be reasonable to do as a plugin because it's uh, more of a real time thing. Uh, Aircrack builds a large database of packets and then does lots of scary math on them. Uh, I don't think that's really a runtime app as much as a post-processing because if every time you added a new packet, you probably have to start recalculating all of your data that you've uh, run so far and that could be a couple days worth of work in some cases. Are so. you seeing any really interesting proposals for plugins? Um, I haven't seen too many yet. Uh, mainly I'm hoping that I can you know, turn the API loose and people will think of things I didn't mm -hmm. uh, and for things where I didn't want to integrate it into the source. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is keep Kismet passive. It just makes my life much simpler that I can say to people, it's not going to attack your network. They might do something with it and attack your network. Mm -hmm. But uh, so in this case, uh, when I have things I don't want to uh, integrate in the code, I can have people write them as plugins. Share the blame. Yeah, share the blame, pass the buck. Uh, it should also allow it to be much easier to port it to Windows. And if there are any uh, drivers in the future for Windows that allow capture, uh, it should be possible to do a uh, complete capture source in Windows as a plugin. Cool. Uh, you can already do capture sources in Linux as a plugin, so. Very cool. Thanks. Right, go, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I recently read somewhere about an attack involving sending packets that exploited the actual driver of the network card so that you don't actually have to be accepting connections or probing to yeah, get hacked. Yeah, that's going to be the talk at Black Hat. Yeah. I don't believe the details on that have been released no, yet. I think he's talking about simple nomad stuff from Schmuckong. No, I, uh, are you talking about the recent one that's going to be at Black Hat? Yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, they, they haven't released many details okay. on that yet. Okay. But Basically, for those of you who might not know what we're talking about, 
at ShmooCon, Simple Nomad gave a talk. Um, it was entitled Hacking the Friendly Skies. Everybody thought it was about you know trying to hack an airplane and make it crash or something. But it, what it was was he had figured that you know he's sitting back in you know cattle class and you know Mr. Executive's up front there you know sitting there with champagne working on his laptop. You're in an environment where there's no other access points. Well, you know, there's that whole big spiel in the front saying, you know, please turn off all your wireless devices. Well, most executives probably don't even know how to do this. You can tell I get a really high opinion of executives. Um, so they leave, you know, Bluetooth or they leave their their Wi-Fi running. Well, Simple Nomad basically figured uh, a way to get that uh, to connect his laptop to theirs without them having to configure anything. And he was sitting in back in cattle class and you know poking through shares and everything and just seeing all sorts of interesting stuff because you're in a contained environment that people don't expect to be attacked over wireless. And this other one is going to be released at Black Hat and it's basically 802.11 fuzzing, just throwing all sorts of crap at uh, wireless drivers and watching them fail in interesting and in one case a fairly spectacular way. Um, no details yet. But We'll see you in about a week. Yeah. From the public re publicly released stuff that was, I believe, on the Black Hat page in Slashdot, it sounds like it's a bug uh, at the driver level, basically in the Windows kernel, which would let you send a couple frames and own Windows at the kernel. <laughs> but you'll have to wait for their Black Hat presentation for that one. Um, the interesting thing about driver attacks in the future is that so what if you're running a firewall? It just got owned at the wireless layer before it passed it to the IP layer, assuming it was even a data frame. Did that answer the question? Or? Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Don't be shy. You look like you got something down there. Is, is me. Is the API on CDS yet? Uh, yeah, the plugin API is in subversion. Uh, the whole uh, new development is in subversion. It's publicly accessible. Um, it's actually the plugin API is part of what's running the access points here this year. So the access point control mechanism to configure them all from the NOC is actually a plugin to Kismet which configures radios. Nice toys. So I remember last year there was some talk about uh, USB devices and exploiting USB drivers. And now this kind of came back again, but over wireless. Has anybody figured out how to write exploit code that runs on a PCI bus yet? Uh, at ShmooCon, uh, Hickory had a talk, or Hikari, Hikari I'm angling Hikari. his name, Hikari. Uh, had a talk uh, briefly about using the PCI bus to do reverse DMA mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also mention there, uh, what, you're what you're talking about with USB, I believe, is not actually a USB driver hack, mm -hmm. it's a USB hardware hack. Uh, if you confuse the USB bus uh, sufficiently, you, um, you can gain DMA access to the system, which allows your device plugged into the USB device or USB bus to map system memory starting at byte zero right. out from underneath Windows or whatever operating system is running uh, and then modify it. Okay. Uh, so it's a slightly different attack vector. <laughs> uh, can you lean forwards a little? Uh, it was a slightly different attack vector. Yeah, that would be a physical attack vector. Right. Uh, I believe there was a similar one announced in Firewire. Okay. Um, I'm sure if you Google it, you can find more on them. Uh, I don't see any theoretical reason why you couldn't perform a similar attack with uh, a firmware exploit to a bu uh, card bus or mini PCI card, but I haven't seen it done. Uh, maybe we will. It would be very complex to do, but okay. that hasn't stopped previous very interesting attacks from happening. Okay, thanks. Now, I just want to say, just looking at 802.11 security over the last couple of years, you know, we've gone from WEP where they're saying, oh yeah, just, you know, 40-bit WEP is okay. You know, that's oh, all I you think we've gone from hiding your SSID to 40-bit WEP. To yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there was a point where 40-bit 40 40-bit WEP was all you could get because of the export restrictions. And then we went to 128, and then, you know, that was found to suck. So we went to WPA. That had problems. Now we're going to WPA2. And that's even got some problems. I mean, you start looking at the, the micro countermeasures and even little issues that will be revealed at DEF CON, but um, WPA isn't even bulletproof. Somewhere along the line, we're probably going to catch up, but time will have moved on and we'll be way ahead of that. 
there just seems to be no sane way of running 802.11 right now short with just what's packaged with it. You're having to go to VPNs or, or other products on top of it. Um, I just think that the IEEE working groups um, really need to get their act together and realize they need to keep pace with everybody else. And how many of you have businesses that you support or even at home that your gear is still only web capable? You know, you get an old uh, WAP 11 or something like that. Yeah, a number of you. So many businesses will invest in the infrastructure and they'll get a security auditor to come in and says, yep, you're secure. You've got you know, web on and everything. everything's good now. Well, how many of them are keeping up on this? The internet moves at the speed of light here. Changes um, in policy don't move at the speed of light. There's so many cases where a business policy is, oh, you know, our remote offices have to run web. Well, they'll revisit that 18 months. Well, the next three layers of security have been blown out of the water by then, so they're so far behind the curve. You really need to have somebody on your staff with their ear to the ground that has the ability to make policy changes on the fly, saying, okay, yesterday WEP was sufficient. Today, it's not. You know, okay, we're gonna have to invest in new infrastructure. This is just the nature of, uh, this is a reality. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a less technical question. And Lean forward. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what can we do as people and consumers about retarding the adoption of RFID? I, uh, nothing. There's nothing that can be done. You could boycott Walmart if they enforce that because know, nobody shops at Walmart, and I'm sure we can all keep it from. Uh, no, no, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, there's like the fifth largest economy. Kind of hard to avoid them. Um, I think the, it depends what level of RFID you're talking about. I mean, there, if you're talking about like... Well, for instance, when I get a bank card, lean forward, when I get a bank card from my bank yeah. and they've decided to put RFID in my new debit card, yeah. whether or not I want it, it pisses me off a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you have a microwave? Yeah, I mean, but do I, that doesn't stop a hundred other people from, who don't know what RFID is you know, from getting those cards and using them and having yeah. stuff happen. I could have a the, microwave The suggestion party. was yeah, to invite yeah. them to use your microwave. Yeah. I guess that's the best we got right now. Yeah. And, um. you know, a lot of this stuff, too, is it's just getting uh, pervasive. I mean, how many people drive Fords or Ford-related Ford, Ford -related products? Um, Ford Explorer is the most popular vehicle in the U.S. Since uh, the 2004 model, I think the keys are all been RFID um, uh, implanted. Transponder. Yeah, there's a transponder in the key. Um, and and that that is broken. It was based on a 40-bit encryption and... Proprietary uh, algorithm. Yeah, they, they that was broken uh, a year ago, uh, 18 months ago now. Uh, you can duplicate those keys on the fly. I think it's also just a matter of uh, social education catching up. I mean, uh, ARFID is new. Uh, a lot of people don't even... I mean, I don't want to say everybody's dumb, although I do often say that, but uh, I mean, a lot of people that go out and buy a cell phone don't necessarily understand, you know, how radio wave propagation and whatnot works, and we're expecting them to understand that a little chip in their credit card could be dangerous to them. I mean, it, how long have we been talking about RFID credit cards now? Maybe two years? It's probably going to be another three or four years before, you know, there's enough doom and gloom danger stories on the media to... Uh, have that pick up. I mean, we're still getting, we're still now seeing stories about how dangerous it is to have a, dangerous it is to have an unencrypted wireless network and, you know, about every two weeks some local news station does an expose about they got, you know, the local long-haired kid with a black t-shirt in the neighborhood to drive them around and uh, <laughs> terrify got all the Pringles people, can. to terrify all the people in their town about the dangers of an open wireless network. We're still seeing that happening now. Yeah, he's saying so in two years from now, it's probably not going to be RFID. It. That's just going to be another aggregated nuisance. Another aggregated nuisance. nuisance. Uh, yeah, could be. Could be. Yeah, I think we have another question. Yeah. So with the current configuration of many access points with all of their vulnerabilities running Linux, why do you think we've not seen an entirely AP-based worm yet that's just exploiting firmware to firmware to firmware in your urban environment? You're hoping so you we have, have read my DEF CON talk, haven't you? 
Yeah, we, we actually, uh, two years ago, came up with a proof of concept for doing that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's entirely possible that that could happen. Um, the, there's a couple of things that make it a little bit more difficult, at least on the surface, uh, in that you actually have to probably stop for a couple of minutes, make a connection, um, you know, get, get some transfer. I, we haven't seen anything that would actually go where you could just drive down the road and be connecting and actually get a worm to go across. Now, there's but nothing to say that if there wasn't an exploit for one of these firmwares, I mean, how many consumers upgrade the firmware on their Linksys router outside, of, you know, once they've taken it out of the box? Not a lot. It, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Most people don't even set passwords, yeah. so we're yeah. not even talking so. about exploits here. We're just talking yeah. about, so. you know, log in, upload new firmware. Thank you. There'll be limitations with memory, he's saying, but even then, all you need to do is just say open up Telnet or something like that, or, or just you know, yeah. it's a, an open spam relay or something like that. As long as the user still sees the Linksys front end, uh, everything's you know all nice and peachy as far as they're concerned. Back to my original point: How do you check? There's no method I know of so far, especially on consumer gear. You you can't pull your drive and throw it in another machine and MD5 some things from a uh, unowned kernel at that point. In reference to uh, people who, I guess, uh, aren't technically adept, like just the random person that walks into a Best Buy and says, uh, I want a, you know, I want a uh, notebook, you know, it's got to be wireless, you know, and they bring it home, there's no encryption, even though, you know, most of the stuff out there isn't that good anyway. Do you think the people that a technology isn't a hobby to are going to catch on and say, you know what, you know, this is only a computer, but I really need to, you know, look into the, the manual or look into... You know what I'm doing on this is going to affect, you know, my finances. You know, any, anything about my life because most people, in reference to anything, cars, technology, they usually just use it as a tool, like a hammer, and just throw it back into the box. Where you know, if it's a hobby, you'll tend to fall over, you know, the problems of a certain technology and I mean, hopefully that, try to fix them. I that's, think that's been the bane of um, tech's existence from the beginning: is getting people to read the friggin' manual. It just th that's one of those insurmountable problems. Um, making people aware that, you know, they are personally vulnerable to this, you know, unfortunately, Fox News seems to be the, the, the king of that, of just scaring the like, daylights out of people with these big, huge articles they do on TV. Um, I actually have to applaud Microsoft. I never thought I'd say that. Um, when they were producing hardware, uh, wireless hardware, their setup wizard actually, you had to physically, you, you had to click and say, no, I don't want to use a web key. So that little action of not being uh, open by default led to a lot of networks being secured that probably wouldn't have otherwise. That's not saying that people didn't just turn it off anyways, but it was leading people down the right path. And that's where I think a lot of manufacturers need to do is they need to kind of like steer the cattle down this way, not the other way. Yeah. I think also the awareness is rising in general. I mean, uh, five years ago, how many people downloaded Elf Bowling? I mean, not, not, not a show of hands here, but I mean, in general, how many people downloaded Elf Bowling? Bowling, a whole lot. How many people heard of malware and Trojans? Probably not that many. Uh, now you watch TV, Citibank commercials, Earthlink commercials. Citibank has identity theft recovery services. Uh, Earthlink's talking about their Trojan blockers and antiviral stuff. Uh, I mean, that reaches people. They're beginning to get more educated about it. So uh, I think the awareness of, what, of that, you know, the average person would need to protect themselves is rising. Um, I think there'll probably be also be uh, not that many people necessarily targeting the average person. I mean, there'll be the guy in your neighborhood who needs internet who doesn't want to buy a cable modem. We'll look for the next open access point. Uh, there may in the future be people who write scrapers that go through the neighborhood or like a worm activity or something like that to scrape the personal data. But I mean, generally, most people aren't that interesting and it's not worth breaking into their computers. Uh, the threat comes when that becomes automated and it spreads and uh, turns into a worm or something like that. A couple things. Um, one, as you mentioned, uh, the Windows kernel being owned uh, by uh, by attacking the the firmware on the, uh, the wireless device driver. D uh, driver. Um, is there any way, say, to write out, like for, for instance, with Linux, to write a kernel module that would be able to detect that sort of thing? Um, uh, you should be able to just do it with like 
Kismet or even a TCP dump filter. Uh, once the data becomes public, if that packet is, uh, is known, then, uh, I mean, you, it, would, it, whatever it is has to be in that packet payload. So if you're in monitor mode, you should be able to sniff it and write uh, some detector. I mean, you could just do it with TCP dump and grep. But you'd have to have it on all the time, and by the right, time you'd you have to be watching. It, it would be too late. Which is why you need a wireless IDS system to know when somebody's shooting at you. Right. So. Right. The other thing is, what if you've exported the configuration on a, a modified firmware AP? Is there, I mean, I, I imagine, I would think that the configuration would change in some way. Not guaranteed, but... My research was in WRT 54Gs. All of their settings, you know, channel, SSID, things like that, were all stored in the NVRAM, which survives during a flash. So, as far as a user sees, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're rather hiccuped. Oh, you know, now it's back. Same SSID, same channel. Everything looks the same. So. Yeah, I, I've, I've reflashed a lot of, of um, devices over the years, and, and I haven't seen one that you actually had to go back and reprogram the SSID or the channel or any of that. It all stays behind. So um, if that becomes a real possibility, then I don't see a, a use end user who's relatively clueless about it being tipped off because of the fact that something changed because it won't. It's as simple as that. And if they didn't set a password, do you think they're going to notice if it changed the channel? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it still links this as the SSID. I guess something I wanted to point out is more of a comment too is it's amazing how many organizations actually use wireless um, in default mode without passwords and actually use it as key parts of the organization. I've seen one that actually used a data center and had a wireless access point that went two miles to where their offices were. And it was amazing. It went over a toll, it went over a toll booth where any moron could basically grab any of their key data, including um, basically breaking out their VoIP system. I, I mean, believe. And I've seen this actually quite often in you know, what I used to do. So it's just amazing how many of these organizations are actually doing this. I believe there's a talk tomorrow that in fact covers some of that exactly. Okay, we probably have time for one or maybe two questions if they're quick, and then we're getting uh, flat. Just a comment. As far as telling if your firmware has been hacked or not, for the WRT54Gs, if you're running um, any, of the Linux's, or any of the Linux firmwares, for example, OpenWRT, you can compile and run Osiris on it, which is the firmware or host integrity monitor. But that, of course, only applies if you're technically savvy and care enough to watch in the first place, in mm. which case you're probably not going to be exploited. Exactly. Yep. Right. Yep. But I mean, if it does get owned, how would you check it? Because you can't look at it directly. You can't pull the drive and examine it under something that's not booting the kernel that's potentially owned. Well, what, um, what Osiris will do is they'll go through and actually do MD5 checksum on it. Right. But if the only way to do that would be to get the file from the machine over SCP where it's served by the kernel that may be owned, or to get the file locally served by the kernel that may be owned which may lie to you. If you're just going to a configuration utility and looking at a, a box that says, you know, the checksum for your fir firmware is, well, it's kind of hard, easy to put a real Linksys, what are the real what Linksys? What happens is you've be. got a server and the client component. So the server's got the known hashes of it and then actually checks yeah. from the client. And yeah. the thing is you'd have to have a, I guess, malicious a kernel that is looking out for that in order to subvert Osiris. So. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and like, down you, the like you said, if you're that sophisticated, you're probably not going to be worried about that in the first place. It's, you're not going to be that vulnerable to it, or you're just not running Linksys gear. Yeah. Well, I think that's about it for our time. Uh, we'll be around if people want to talk to us after. <laughs>